Good evening, everyone. And welcome. I'm John Weinstein, the provost here at Bard College at Simons Rock, and I'm so excited to welcome you to the book one reading featuring Pragita Sharma. I remember back in 2006 when this first started, I was faculty at the time when we began with Chinua Achebe as our first book one author. And in the years since, we've seen a wide array of amazing writers come and read for us. Of course, well, we usually do this as an in person session. Of course, we've had to be virtual this time, but that doesn't make it any less special. And I'm so excited to have Brigitte here. To introduce her, there's no one better than my esteemed colleague, and himself a very accomplished poet and translator, faculty and literature, Peter Filkins. And so it's my great pleasure to introduce Peter so that he can in turn introduce Brigitte, who's not only book one author for the year, but also an alum of Simon's Rock. Peter? Hello, thank you, John. I'm Peter Filkins. It is a real pleasure to be introducing uh, Prigita Sharma uh, tonight. Um, I would suggest to the audience that you might choose a speaker view so that uh, you, you have a full look at Prigita when she's doing her reading. Uh, I'd like to remind you that this event is being recorded. Um, you're not appearing on screen as audience members because it's a webinar, but we are recording the event. And uh, you should probably mute your mics, um, although I guess because you're not participants, uh, that shouldn't be a, uh, an effect. We, after Brigitte reads uh, from her beautiful new book, um, we will be holding a Q&A. And if you go down to the bottom of your screen on the right hand side, you'll see Q&A and that is the uh, place to submit your questions uh, to Brigitte uh, following the reading. Uh, before we start, Brigitte's reading is book one of, uh, for 2020, and uh, it is also part of the poetry and fiction series at Simon's Rock, which will continue throughout the fall. Um, our next reader will be the novelist uh, Mona Simpson on Thursday, September 24 at 7.30 p.m. If you go to the uh, events calendar for the college, you'll see a Zoom link to join that reading, virtual reading. Uh, following that will be Valeria Luiselli, uh, the author of uh, Lost Children Archive, which has been a huge success uh, in this country. She will be reading on Thursday, October 22nd at 7.30 p.m. and we'll be putting out a Zoom link for that reading. And then on November 17th, Tuesday, November 17th, Peter Gizzi, poet Peter Gizzi from the University of Massachusetts uh, will be reading, who I know actually knows uh, Prigita, and they've been longtime friends too. That too will be at 7.30 p.m. will be on Tuesday rather than the Thursday, and we'll be putting out a Zoom link. So you're all very welcome. All of those readings will be followed by uh, Q&A sessions. They will be actually live uh, Zoom uh, readings, so you'll have a chance to participate live uh, in, the, in the readings themselves. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brigitte, and I would begin by saying, just quoting her, poetry, I hope, is a kind of learned articulation and sentient expression of attachment to everything we put into it, writes Pragita Sharma at the end of Grief Sequence, her book-length sequence of poems that honors, wrestles with, and navigates her devastating loss following the death of her husband, Dale Sherard, from esophageal cancer in 2015. Not only does Sharma bring everything she has to the subject, she also brings everything that poetry has. Quote, poetry and grief are the same, she observes. You are taught to care about it when it happens to you. While W.H. Auden cautioned that poetry makes nothing happen, Sharma reminds us of the need for poetry in our most desperate hours. Those times when, quote, words are simply the utterance of what half thoughts can look like when we can't help but speak to ourselves. What grief sequence does for such need is to provide a model of a way through grief devoid of palliatives and easy narratives of solace or healing. Instead, we are confronted with Loss, mirroring, it, mirroring its inward entanglements, glow torches you have never seen before, 
the white heat of grief never turned down, but tempered, directed, shaped, and shaping, and returning us to what Robert Frost, Frost saw as the only aim of poetry, namely to, quote, drink and be whole again, beyond confusion. In addition to grief sequence, Brigitte Sharma is also the author of Undergloom, Infamous Landscapes, The Opening Question, which won the 2004 Fence Modern Poets Prize, and Bliss to Fill. She is the founder of the conference, Thinking Its Presence, Race, Creative Writing, Literary Studies, and Art, a recipient of the 2010 Howard Foundation Award, and a finalist just recently for the, of the 2024 Quartets Prize from the Poetry Society of America, she has taught at the University of Montana and is now the Henry G. Lee 37 Professor of English at Pomona College. I am especially pleased and proud to welcome her back to Simon's Rock, even if it is virtually, for she was my first poetry student at the college many years ago. With that, I'll ask for your virtual welcome and we'll turn the screen over to Brigitte Sharma. Peter, thank you. That was really lovely. And it, um, I just have such warmth in my heart for Simon's Rock and the community that I was able to um, have there to write poems, to write poems that really um, mattered to me and really taught me so much about myself. Um, I'm also, it was so nice to hear Peter Gizzi's name because after I studied with Peter Filkins at Simon's Rock, I studied with Peter Gizzi at Brown. And um, also Peter was part of the Berkshires community poetry world for a long time. And so I just love how we all keep returning to the Berkshires. It's an honor to be here. And I will be reading uh, from Grief Sequence. And so I'll be, kind of looking a little bit over here. Um, I'm gonna kind of not read in order, um, but start with, um, well, first I'm gonna start with a few lines that inspire this book, which is from Roland Bart, Morning Diary. Not to suppress mourning, suffering, the stupid notion that time will do away with such a thing, but to change it, transform it, to shift it from a static stage, stasis, obstruction, recurrences of the same thing to a fluid state. This is what helped me um, start writing this book was I found Barth's Morning Diary, which was um, a collection of fragments and um, observations and thoughts in diary, kind of a diary form that Barth wrote about his uh, grieving his mother. And there's actually a beautiful line in it um, that I said earlier to Peter's class, but I'll repeat it to you because I think it, it, can, it punctuates a lot of um, what, what, what my book um, explores and um, what I'm interested in thinking about more and what, what literature is. And he wrote, what literature is that I cannot read without pain, without choking on truth. Um, and that, um, that's what we end up kind of examining when we're thinking about grief. But in my reading out of order, I'm going to start with an elegy or an elegy that doesn't want to be an elegy. And it's a poem um, in the section Glacier National Park, which is um, a section that just holds this poem. And I was asked uh, to um, write a poem for Glacier, Glacier National Park on its 100th anniversary. And I hadn't um, actually really been there, even as I had been a Montanan for, um, uh, you know, 10 years at that point, um, I, or less than 10 years, um, I had never really spent enough time um, in the park. And so I decided to go and write a poem and figure out um, my experience of it. Glacier National Park and the Elegy. For Mike, July 2016. After Dale's sudden cancer, his body wasting swiftly to death, I didn't believe in love or beauty or my ability to write poems. And my grieving turned into a sequence of writing hostile little elegies in solitary sittings. 
Elegies ceased being elegant. I guess I was trying to understand the shape of a new sorrow in its deep recognition. How easily it had foraged for my marginalized hungers that felt legitimately nullified. With it, figurative language estranged itself from crafting mutable metaphors of the natural world, standing in its place with adjectival phrases. Landscape, though permissible, seemed to only swell around, retaining rivers beneath me with a grave distance as bodies ensued to ashes. And I didn't utter dust to dust. And yet only after losing many months in time, I did slowly begin to notice a greener, faint tint to the sunlight. This felt like a small divinity. Finding you was this too, after such importunate abandonment. I said, this is a remarkable lightness I feel. I couldn't imagine it before I felt it. You told me to look at the moon, I did. That's what you did after Murray died. And you believed all moons in the sky to be elegiac or real. You represented a steadfast truth. I proposed then a drive to Glacier, a fine, faultless finery, the firs, pines, and stillness. We drove up higher than I expected up the steepest corners and edges, and I looked out at spring sustenance, an earthwork of forest trees, scored in majestic columns, bedded and wooded, coated with needles, fully medicinal, a simile of shedding, of giving over the live, live forested body to its eminence, of the mountain's height, its splendor drop, because of its scare quality. I felt hesitant to look out, but for descriptors, the rounded grass tufts near the car grates, then a hell drop, a belt of green, stones and gravel and gray peeking through. This driving with you is a climb of faith, I think, and I feel it along with a helpless irritation of lust in my throat and gut and a pair of calloused and ashen calves and feet I seem to have earned. You helped me through a dry summer, fall, winter, and now summer. 10 months after he died, he and I all these years had never gone, only near it to Flathead or Whitefish, to fireplace lodges tucked away. I brought you to the weeping walls. After you drove still farther, we turned around when I threatened fear of heights. I don't know how to celebrate 100 years this high up, but you do, and you visit, a winding high up with me, your glasses cocked on your head, a strange black visor of blackish hair, camera chest centered, erect lens outward but modest, two circles looking above my direction at the field of bear grass with its white stalks and awkward loomed light. I was unable to get out of the car at Heaven's Peak because the sublime was frightening. But I crawled around the side and peered over and I knew. I would never use the word heaven to describe anything I saw of death, but I needed to see beauty understood in a scrap of its light and not be afraid of it taking me with it. Along the way, I had seen him disappear into illness. I must hold you where I can see you clearly and never plow the hard won truth of pitching death and flinging its burden into spaces. No treason I feel now because the arrows of the natural world lingers in sentience, flooding with its central questions of what collectivity crushes. I held on to the silver bumper of your car and clutched your hand because it was your hand and you too were silvery behind frank light and squinting to see into a camera's moon, a lingering present tense we gave ourselves over to, lifted to frame its blue course, a formal sky of impert impertable um, clouds of unambiguous secularity. We take a simple walk by the car now. I started with that one because um, that is written, um, um, 
a year after Dale's death and um, over a year after that. And it is a love poem. It's also a poem about grief. And I wanted to think about the natural world and the way in which we write the elegy and what it holds. Um, and this one is actually way more lyrical than the others. And so I thought I'd um, start there in order to then bring us back um, to earlier poems and to earlier spaces and to move um, into part of that kind of um, back into that world eventually. Um, I wrote this poem, um, which is the first poem in the book, um, after uh, reading Alice Notley. Um, I loved um, thinking about her, um, her just ferocity and her style and her addresses. Um, uh, she actually, she lost two husbands. So I thought about her as someone I wanted to get some strength from. Um, on seclusion and looking out after Alice Notley. Seclusion may kill your heart in the process of producing the love stained stench in your poems, the ones containing boundaries of shame with their sober problems. Bits describing loss, mirroring its inward entanglements, glow torches you have never seen before. You light them with two selves and don't wait for anything to flicker false. You can discern the lantern of a falling man who burned down his desire with tiny humiliated gestures. The mountain peak so high, thus you believe it gives you the one majestic evening you earned. Its embrace is a gentle coercion into wide wilderness, an amenable tyranny of its expansion, grief's artillery to fill all of the black clouds that sallow blue sky, painting it with electric photographic sweeps. You have to find your strength in this. I also see that as almost a Rilkean moment of you must change your life. Um, so there's a little nod to Rilke there. Complicated Spiritual Grief, Part One. It wasn't violent. It was, sorry, it was violent and it wasn't. It was violent because it was the kind of cancer to which people refer as beastly, as pure evil. And though I do not really believe in a Christian God or devil, I was left facing one. I'm a non-believer. When I faced it, all I had was his past before the cancer and what was leading up to it which led me down his rabbit hole, which may have included a brain tumor and many other tumors, all the spindly parts, tumor-shaped, even things painted for me by his admirers, some faulty, some careless, spindly grievers. I couldn't look at any of them as they kept metastasizing, but that was an action I knew was not mine to claim, but through my affections for my beloved. How could I not love some of his friends or students? How is it that I settle on these feelings as he disappears? Before I read Complicated Spiritual Grief Part Two, I want to say that Dale and I used to teach a class together. Um, well, I taught a class called um, Polanski and Cassavetes, where I paired those two uh, film directors and uh, their films. And there is one um, class where Dale um, joined me in teaching Cassavetti's Husbands. And if you know the film Husbands, you can get a kind of picture or kind of sense of where I'm going with this poem. Complicated Spiritual Grief, Part Two. Because I am the kind of non-believer who believes in the culture around me, I was watching for fragments to arise out of our habits, such as watching madmen or thinking about madmen, as Dale always said. Men who are always falling from buildings out of fear, anguish, alcoholism, a particular self-destruction from self-annihilation, pinhole pains. Like in Cassavetti's Husbands, there were these men. I found his notes for teaching that film, and at first I thought it was his personal confession, but it wasn't. It was a list of teaching notes. Infidelity, vomiting, being a father, being a husband. I thought about his sonic piece titled, Sorry About the Rage. I was sorry about it too. So what now? I grieve. I lust for company that I can't ask for. I turn into my own madman. Can I do this? 
Did he enter my body, his energy? Can I be him lusting for himself? So um, as, as, um, as Peter mentioned in the introduction, um, Dale uh, died of esophageal cancer. He was diagnosed in November 2014 and he died in January 2015, exactly two months um, to the day actually of the diagnosis. Um, and so it was a lot to process and I just started trying to write then the first poem that I, I actually found this poem, I don't remember writing it. I don't even think it, it as a poem and I was telling Peter's class this, I see it as a diary entry that helped um, give me permission to write these prose poems and these poems. November 23rd, 2014. I've been writing to you for such a long time that I stopped writing and began speaking to you. I was speaking to you before you even started drinking your coffee and you kept pleading with me to wait until you finished. Could you give me a minute? I'm listening to you. I listen to every word. It's true. I didn't write poems to you anymore because I have you in my company and in my company I have you and I have, and I have to understand what it means to have your company. Does it mean I just talk to you until you die? Until you don't know what I'm saying and I can't say it anymore? Is this why I have to write poems now? If I can't talk to you anymore, I won't know what to do with myself. What I did do with myself after Dale died was I started to listen to 70s light music from the Pandora state, from my Pandora app. And, uh, and I found that, um, <laughs> The 70s narrative uh, was really kind of all consuming. I, and I, I'll give you an example of, of singers that fall under that category. Um, David Gates from Bread. I was convinced that all of those poems um, of David Gates's and Bread were a speaker speaking from the dead to the living. And that was a, a way, a kind of solace to think that there might be poems that you could kind of, um, or you could listen to a lyric that could speak back to you or that a loved one could speak back to you. Um, so I had a kind of a, a celebration of that um, experience of finding myself in the 70s narrative. 70s light and 14 joys and 14 furies. All my life I waited to sing holler in the bathtub to my own pure dewdrop fury but it only came with your death and my aching to live out the adequacy of a 70s narrative all the way to its heart probe peak and loss. I was a margin cord rammed with storytelling and with susceptible palpitation to sentimentality in search of a piston. I was sounding out each coarse tangled lyric, unladylike, but finding comfort in its seam. And I was listening to Bob Welch's Sentimental Lady, if that gives you any context, which I just have a weakness for that song. And now I'm into some sequences. This is kind of a list poem, which will then be followed by a longer prose poem. Learning without knowing implicit, loving explicit, dying explicit, organizing implicit, Institutional hate implicit, grieving explicit, compromise implicit, dreaming organizational, staying in house implicit, leaving house explicit, sequence then recursion. Sequence one. What is explicit now is that I had been a defenseless dependent for those years. I wasn't hedging a bet with a life then. I was just helping myself to it and to the party of coupledom and its normality and its rewarding of intimate interferences and to this one person I loved. I ground life to a powder underfoot with the dominion of freedom in front of me. We both did carelessly then. We shared a living grief of what disturbed us about others, but it lived only in a grievance and in the exterior walls. But then this, and I stopped being in those perceptual truths 
of the mind's eye seeing who was where. This was a kind of luxury of living and knowing this. I gave that up without understanding I had to. When it does come back, I will know I'm healing. What followed? I was struck back up, bent forward, and sprung from my dry, hapless complacency. You see, I was sitting for too long, but at a certain point, I see, I just buckled, and then he quickly slipped into a part of himself that became part of the hospital. Memories curved and then sounded, were sibilant in jest and from not his mouth and not his teeth. And the breath grew so sharp and he grew so thin and gaunt and he was buried in a slander his body made of him. And I could only spurn cancer as an enemy. Nonetheless, it overtook, was inside his brain, his chest, a tumor catching the lymph nodes. And did he tell the doctor he didn't love me anymore and that's why I wasn't allowed into those conversations? Did he want to end with his end and not share it with me? I was a nobody outside of his illness, as was he, but there was no togetherness in there except for something I craved of him and he of me. Perhaps we couldn't do stout-hearted with too much talk, or we must have really believed we had time there was not the send-off of which we held each other in the deepness of ourselves, the kind with dramatic northeasterly consciousness. No, it was a disaster of insufficiency that now I learn is what death does with you if you watch it take out what it needs. It's the power outage with the powdery starch, granules trailing the floor, one foot in front of the other, I've said now to a nobody with me in the laundry room. I spoke out to a nobody that was once him, but I don't believe in the idea that he'd even follow me there. Sequence seven. I thought he was over-medicating himself and planning his suicide. I took the pills away from him. He looked defeated. He said as much. I felt sorry for both of us. His expressions held this enormity and a seared, exhausted center. Spatial discomfort started to affect him, but didn't take hold till the next day when he started to lose consciousness and rattled the house yelling about thieves, robbers, drunks, and pill snatchers. We didn't know what was going on. The tumor was rapidly metastasizing its mass through his cerebellum. His body became harder to manage and he sprang fearfully through the house, tugging violently at his bile duct tube. Asia and I camped in the front rooms. The last night of intimacy, of lucidity, unbeknownst to me, we sat huddled and I caressed him, cradling his arms, his legs, and his penis. I was sure we had time left for more, but this was the last time he spoke and searched my face and looked at me with a recognition I understood. It's how we moved out of consciousness and I'm haunted by those last days before we succumbed to hospice. I remember how stunning he was resting in bed the week before in our library with a cornflower blue sheeted bed prepared lovingly by Ashby and Spider. In that bed, an unofficial hospice. He had a look of wonder when we put movies on. He excited over Wilson, the ball and castaway, and stared unblinkingly at Tom Hanks. We giggled over this and appreciated how Andrew put the Eno station on next and Asia lit and framed the sheeted bed with twinkling lamp and illuminant bulbs Dale found soothing. We all watched him compose in the air to fill up glass. I wished that we could have unleashed him to his afterlife then. That's what he would have wanted, a release to his own universe, sonant and material, an ethereal ball, an awkward Tom Hanks, a Wilson, and a castaway in a glittering hand-printed sea. This death sequence was the one I wanted for him. So 
So Dale was a sound uh, artist and a composer. And so there's, there, there are many moments in the poems where I refer to sounds or I'm thinking about sounds or I'm thinking about his sounds. My poem about last sounds. The summer deck is filling with riotous rain pouring down from your hands, I think. I'm terrible at these supernatural images. You wouldn't like it if I kept it up. I know you are trying to water the plants and the seedlings and all of everything I might have neglected for the last three months while I'm here fucking it all up. You let me sit in my nightgown all day while I type on the computer under heaps of shitty books. You want me to move into something meaningful and I know you were a function of whatever it is because you gave me all the departing desires as a way of teaching me to cope and to stay a poet when I don't feel like being a poet. Now the challenges and how I put all this in me in the way that you've always presented me with possibilities, a kind of irreverence. What, I, what do I do with the heart and rage? You tend to those plants now after I've killed them and exactly in rain streaming, a figurative blue that pools and floods, damning everything but me with this uncivil domesticity, fighting to sound out all the activity no longer between us unanswered in time and space. I would tell you every day if I could that you are still exuberant. Meanwhile, there is still time in the day. I find the sounds are louder now. I don't hear you talking to yourself in the hallways late in the evening as you used to do. It was a robbed mumbling that echoed. Your drink, your vices, the privacy which you spoke to a mute night. I noticed after you were gone that there were no more orality that started toward a finishing tension, a drone drowned in hollow floors and a sunburned house and one now planted with proprietary neglect. I look at your handwriting. I look at your handwriting and it pushes space into its narrow field. His were big atmospheric box crosses with architecture. Your speech and talk are the opposite. You have soft catalytic vowels. His were hard chains of dream speak. How is this possible? What is richly characterized by handwriting? What is its dictionary of attributes? Where is there an airy space between the way he and I loved? Because then and suddenly I loved again and it arose against sequential time. This makes loving two persons its own counsel. One followed the other, but there is still simultaneity. The other loved me, but had trouble loving and I had to absorb this after death. There is loving without knowing and loving with so much knowing. Two bodies separate in the night after the coupling of evening time. One goes up to his room and slowly dies, cigarette after cigarette. After his feeding tube and bile duct were inserted, he wouldn't sleep in our bed. The two broad categories of sequence learning exist, explicit and implicit, with subcategories which also become dreaming and reading the handwriting. You were the first person, and now you are one person, and there is a second person. Explicit sequence learning has been known and studied since the discovery of sequence learning. However, recently, implicit sequence learning has gained more attention in research. A form of implicit learning may be implicit dreaming, maybe a contrary dreaming occurs, maybe dying is more implicit in its sequence, maybe learning refers to the underlying methods of dreaming or airy spaces, or writing words to both beloveds, that contrary people are unaware of what's explicit and what's implicit. In other words, learning without knowing is dreaming. And I think I'm just going to read uh, two, more, two more poems. Um, this one I, I um, I wrote about friendship, but I'm also reminded of the late C.D. Wright, who was also my mentor at, um, in graduate school at Brown. And when I first started working with her, she was writing these, um, what she called these girlfriend poems, these poems about friendship. 
my poem about new friendship for Sarmisha. I met you on a party bench at Gita's during that heated, lived out, musty July when I believed only momentarily in both prophecy and its antithesis. You had never met Dale, never knew Dale. You were my friend you would never meet. Alas, I say to quiet us. This is sad, but it taught me how real it was to move forward, even in making friends. You were a forehead of zeal and impetuousness with an inspirited laugh to behold a danger to my edge and transatlantic like myself. Just then you made a cashew hug gesture, signaling how one can give a distant cashew shaped hug. Needless to say, we nixed that hug for a long road of intimacy, the abridged version, which was required. We discovered this in clip size, accented by beer bottles. Let's not refrain from feeling feelings hosted in newness. Let's celebrate the inanity of being abandoned with vigilance. Do the unappeasable by leaving a world of agents and factors who fall down on their faces. I loved your southern chicken curry, and I love that in this loss, I have found a deep girlfriend armor. Do not ever lighten my load. You let me be cross. I let you be cross. We give cashew hugs to Missoula, Montana. Sometimes the kind we Indians know how to let loose in tight situations. Let this hug modify so much of our shanty hutch deliberations, and let's make sure everyone knows we're pushy because it's our culture to be such. And when we recoil, it's cashew shaped. And I'll end with a love poem. Um, I mean, all of these are kind of love poems. Um, and it also has some 70s music in it. Um, two wonderful bands that, I'll, that you'll see. Abide. You've gone to get your Sorry, I'll start that over. You've gone to get a haircut in Kirkland, but before you left, you rubbed my arms to warm them out of the blankets with a dearness that I thought I would never find. When you grow older and I fret that you too will die, you will tell me that I conflate the stars with tombs. I sang you earth, wind and fire's reasons and we folded into the Delphonics, didn't I blow your mind this time? And I said, you don't even know you did. You were too modest to think you could. And you know somewhere hidden we live now to solve our soft hearts problems, which come from the fallen places where they are the raconteurs who died on us. They took up the largesse of the art of death, but we don't care who had the better lover, the better spouse, the kinder and more considerate one. Now we can just take this morning and stretch out a line of aporia, an aphoristic single-sided horizon of trees, buildings, and sky. Thanks so much. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Pragita. That was a lovely reading. Um, just very, very moving and so lyrical and so just really just beautiful, just wonderful. Um, we have one question and I encourage others to submit questions through the Q&A. Um, the first person says, love these poems. What does grief sequence mean to you? I, get, I take that to mean, what does the book mean to you? Um, you know, I, I think s sequence was a way to think about um, a structure that, th that could hold um, several kinds of poems, many of them being prose poems. Um, and they... Um, the sequence of grieving, I guess, for me, I, start, I wanted to document a time that I knew was not going to make sense to me. And I wanted to find a way to hold everything in this book. Um, so there are lyric poems, there are prose poems, there's some found text where I take a study on esophageal cancer and insert lyrical utterance into it. And then I sort of hopefully just, um, they can all be these, sort of a sequence of examining grief. So is, is this an ex explicit book or an implicit book or I both? Think, I think both, both. I, I liked thinking about, you know, what do you tackle head on and what comes out sideways? And I wanted to think about my language in that way. Um, 
you say in that uh, lovely poem, I look at your handwriting right at the end, learning without knowing is dreaming. Is that a, 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 a sort of a description of your process in writing this book? Yes, yes. That, and I will also say, Peter, which I think can speak to the 70s, um, there's, a, there's like, a, I was really thinking about um, the strange lyrical language of the 1970s where dreaming, like there would, it would just be kind of, um, would like fall into the activity of the narrative. Um, I, I was thinking a lot about bread. I don't know. I know <laughs> bread. I grew up on bread. <laughs> I'm embarrassed to say, but I did. <laughs> There was something, um, yeah. There's, there, there's a, there is a sentimentality I wanted to um, kind of hold on to without it being entirely lodged in my own psyche. Okay. Um, another question uh, is ask: uh, How did you decide on your organization of the book? Um, I, I put a more chronological order together, but as I had told uh, Peter's class. Um, my wonderful editor, Joshua Beckman, really sat with these and helped me order them more aesthetically. And he wanted to see them in clusters of kind of the, the way, the exuberance of the poems themselves um, through their language or their inquiry um, or their style. So they stopped being chronological and they started kind of working stylistically. Did he surprise you in, in his suggestions for orderings or were you did, were there points where you resisted his suggestions and then came to them or? Oh no, I loved them. I felt, I felt too bound to uh, the order of the writing only as a process of recognizing their, um, what they taught me, but it didn't, it didn't, I, I wasn't clear on how they were being read. So that was very helpful. And it, it, it allowed me to see them more um, with some good distance that they had value outside of their chronology. Great. Um, another question, how long was it between each poem or sequence? Was it a consistent time? I take that to mean, you know, did you write consistently for months? Did you have breaks in between? Did you write from beginning to end or? you know, how, how long did it take you to write the book and what was the, that sequence of time like? I guess it took me about um, two years. Um, but I think the, the bulk of it came, um, well, I guess uh, in, it was all in thirds. I think that um, there's a third of it where you have those, um, you know, the, 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 um, the complicated, grief sequence and, and um, the, the, the end complicated spiritual grief and um, on seclusion and looking out, those were the first eight months. Um, the sequences started to make sense to me um, in 2016 and early 2017. And then early 2017, I was just fine tuning all the sequences. Um, the longer prose pieces that felt like recounting, um, you know, just um, moments I was, I, I couldn't shake. Good. Uh, we had this question in the, in the class as well, um, but this person is asking, why did you choose to publish these poems since they're so personal? But let me add, I'm always a little uh, uh, astonished by that question. What poems aren't personal? Um, or I guess, um, how might you given having written the book, defi def define what seems personal or not personal? How do you think about the personal? Well, I do think that all of my work is pretty personal, even if it's, it's not necessarily autobiographical. I think that, I think, I think people are responding to the autobiographical nature of it, that they can point to events and I'm reacting, I'm responding. Um, but I think poetry is always trying to examine what, um, or get closer to um, uh, feelings that are, that are hard to bear or that need to be sh shared. Um, so this felt, uh, this felt important to me to share this experience as I would any of the other books. Mm -hmm. um, and to take a risk in maybe putting it all in there or putting what I thought was all that I had then. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. an experiment. 
I mean, the the personal need not be tied to the to the I either to the to the you know the, the singular individual self, right? I mean, whatever we observe, we observe because we're a person, right? It's not somebody else doing it. So so what we choose to write about can be as personal. I mean, one can you know hopefully write about a steam shovel and make it personal uh, mm -hmm. if if one brings a certain kind of attention attention to it. I guess, did, we, did you have a feeling of writing out of yourself or was there any point where you had to step outside of yourself as poet and as tactician to think, oh, what am I doing here? How am I doing this? Um, or did it just simply come from, from inside out? You know, I, I wanted to trust that the prose poem could hold things. So I really wanted to um, figure out what I was doing. I mean, and also it's so, you know, even just to think kind of visually with the line, like I, I, I have a tight margin here, um, but those lines can feel ragged and unfinished very quickly if, you know, the, the prose poem can feel excessive. So I was really trying to figure out um, what it could hold without feeling excessive and extravagant or letting myself be extravagant with grief and try to figure out what that looks like. Um, Great, good. This is a different kind of question. Uh, did you major in poetry at Simon's Rock? If not, what was your major? <laughs> oh, Peter could also answer that. I did, I mean, I, I, I guess I don't know if the subject is still languages and literature as it was then, um, but I was so, I'm so grateful. I was telling a student this the other day, um, to, write a, to write poems as an undergraduate and put, put it together in book form. You also let me write short stories, nonfiction, and, and, I, and Bill Jackson uh, let me have an exhibit too. Um, I felt so indulged and um, so um, it felt so thorough to be able to examine my voice in these this with this multiplicity of outlets. Um, but poetry was the kind of grounding, formative um, inquiry that that informed everything else. And I felt so lucky to be able to have workshops so early in um, in my studies too. I don't. I look at all the majors and schools and it takes them a while to get into a workshop good um this is back to to the book and and the subject what do you think was the most important action you took during grief what is your biggest regret in it and love the book is the end of the um, wait, wait with the book wait peter the first is what do, what do you think was the most important action you took during grief, oh, during grief. And, and what is your biggest regret during your grief or in the grief? I will say this, the, the smartest thing that was ever said to me, and it was from this widow in a widow group that I, that I hold true is just keep people you trust close and just, you know, let everyone else can go away. Mm -hmm. And um, I would have done more of that too. I would have not, um, I just, I think you just want to hold your dear people close to you and trust them and get rid of the noise, get rid of criticism, get rid of pettiness. Um, I guess my regret is that some of the poems do fret over petty things and distance and not being understood or, you know, being misunderstood. Um, maybe I regret that I make those feelings major, but at the, then I decide that the poem is there to help me work through them. Can you imagine that you will write more poems about Dale or the grief, or do you f find, feel or sense that you were in a, simply in a different place now? I think my poems about Dale more uh, now are more about um, examining um, truths or quibbles or issues. I'm, I'm in a safer place to examine the domesticity of our relationship and um, reflect on a long marriage for me as, you know, being young and having a past with somebody. Um, so I'm still writing. Um, I have a new book of poetry and there are several poems about Dale, 
but they they address um, they just I think they they go into s sort of smaller issues. It's as if um, I'm not I'm not working through the event of death. I'm working now through the event of our lives together. Do you feel in you don't have to talk about it too much, but in the in the new book of poems, would you describe it as writing a sequence, or is that something unique to this book? Uh, yeah, it's not a sequence anymore. Uh, that was unique to grief sequence. Um, I'm back to a lyric form. I think there may be smaller prose poems, but it's not. It's like I I I might write prose again, and I've been working on prose. I'm working on a like a nonfiction book about Dale and um, and my time in Missoula, but I won't revisit the the prose poem. But I, you know who knows. But right now it's the lyric. Um, I'm thinking about um, I'm thinking about abstract expressionism and the Upanishads and putting right. oneself together. Uh, a writer, this is simply a comment. Uh, so beautiful, your voice brings new meaning and life into these poems. Um, mm -hmm. No, not a question there. Uh, but then we do have a question. Do, uh, do you believe that there is a mutually shared aspect of grieving or is it completely different from person to person? Well, I think everybody goes through their own grieving process and should. I do think that it, it helps to um, share um, when, it's, when it's meaningful. Um, I do think that I understand, um, I mean, I, I understand the experience of being a widow in a way that really has changed me. Um, you, you lose your person and you have to, you know, put yourself back together. And so, um, so I do love learning from other people who had to do that. Um, but I do think there's, it, it's different for everybody. How about the fact that your, your new partners is a widower? So, so you've both gone through this. Uh, he helped you find, me. Do you find, do you find yourself, yourselves going through it differently? Do you find uh, ties in, in, your, in your process of grieving or uh, differences? I don't know. It's... Yeah, well, he became my friend, he said, because he didn't want to see me grieve for 10 years, which he did. Wow. So that was the whole, he said, I grieved for 10 years and I don't want you to lose 10 years. Hmm. And so we just talked a lot about that because he had a lot of guilt, he had um, a lot of depression and sadness. And so we just talked, we, we just, we became friends because he talked, he'd listen to me, talk and talk and talk. Um, and I thought was, that, that was, I go, so I guess that support system is really meaningful. And I was open to um, learning from people in a way that I hadn't been before. Good. Um, this ties, this question I think ties to, to uh, Roland Barthes. Um, how do you think the death of the author fits into grief sequence? Does your intention come off better when a reader has context for your life and culture, et cetera? Not quite sure what it's asking. I, I mean, I guess I could think about Bart in relation to how the, like there, there may be a few conceptual poems in there that are more a nod to his theory and to thinking about um, authorship. But then, of course, we just see the conundrum he has in, I mean, I think Morning Diary was collected after his death, but um, so I don't even know how he would feel about Morning Diary <laughs> because it is so, um, so it's a good question to think about um, authorship. I do love thinking about the avant-garde and what poems can do. Um, and so this, this to me is, is less experimental and when it's conceptual it's really in 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 places um so i'm I, yeah that i i could i think just reading him and recognizing that um he was uh so innovative in his thinking um and yet um the the work he's doing in morning diary is is such explicit work i mean it's private work so I was trying to make sense of that for myself. Um, did you write poems and or sequences before the death of your husband or was it trigger, triggered by the event? I guess, sequ I guess the question is, did you write po 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 poetic sequences before the death of Dale or was it triggered by the event? Yeah, not in the same way at all. I might examine uh, poems and have strategies for them 
like I was thinking through certain canonical poems in Undergloom. Um, I was thinking about Whitman there, and but I it didn't feel um, this felt like a triggered style <laughs> that I developed to uh, get through this, and I and I was just influenced by um, beautiful prose um, that you know I I uh, I'm just thinking about other forms or poets who use the prose poem. So back yeah. to to sort of Bart and the morning diary but also the kind of other bookend of, of that literally at the back end of the book is the quote from adam phillips morning yeah. is immensely reassuring because it convinces us convinces us of something we might otherwise easily doubt our attachment to others i see that as a bookend to to Bart and the death of the author do you want to comment on that I, you know, um, Dale introduced me to Adam Phillips when we were first dating. Um, Terror and the Experts was, I think, the first one we read together. Um, and uh, all of his work on Winnicott and attachment and also his, his being a, he's a poet and also he edited, I think, um, I think he edited Penguin's Keats, but I might be wrong. Um, but what I found myself doing is um, looking back at I, you know, Phillips, um, Dale and I used to say that when we read his essays, it was like eating candy um, because of his connection. Yes. Um, so finding that line and thinking about attachment and then the way Phillips will always kind of remind you of how human you are, um, how human you are in your feelings and your attachment. I had to... Um, like kind of bring him in and think through him. Great. Uh, I comment, I loved your reading. I wanted to ask what the intention is of juxtaposing academic terminology and raw personal observations in your narration of grief. Um, you know, I think it started when I was wrestling with the diagnosis of the esophageal cancer and um, Dale was, which I, I sort of refer to this in the in the book. He was losing consciousness, um, and I did think he was over medicating because our palliative care doctor gave him so many pills, um, so many pills to take at once. And I knew that was part of his treatment, but uh, some of it was a a lot. But what happened is that um, if any of you have had that terrible experience of having a loved one in the hospital over the holidays or needing care over the holidays. It's just so spare at the hospital in Missoula that I was di I was like self-diagnosing Dale all the time and reading academic journals to try to figure out should he need an should he get another MRI? And I finally when we when we got a hold of our doc doctor and Dale was slowly losing consciousness, I said to the doctor, from what I've read, he's either over medicating or he has a brain tumor. Mm -hmm. And he had a brain tumor. And so what I wanted to do was bring that language in because it's what I had. And I was trying to figure out, could I make a poem? Could I inject my own cries into the academic language? Could I play with all of this for myself, for therapeutic purposes, but also to examine language also to it strikes me is to take charge of that language that language obviously had charge of you and dale uh, yes. and that's you know that terrible uh antiseptic quality of hospitals and doctors and lack of emotion but it can be so cruel and um but if you if you're taking charge of it in your poem you're you, you're it, it, you're speaking it rather than it speaking you right exactly yes yeah. yeah. Um, someone's asked, in the sequence section, you skipped sequence three and four. Why is that when in your reading? Uh, yeah. You know, when I read too many of them at once, I worry that I just sound um, repetitive or that they're going into a kind of um, vault of uh, one sort of diction. So I skipped them. I gave, I gave you kind of a taste of them. But, but I guess, no, I think Piggy to the question is the sequences are oh numbered one, God. two, oh, yeah. then five, yeah. six. Seven. Sorry, I do have a three and four. And you know, that goes back to, I think I might have a three or four. Um, I either wrote a three or a four, I have to look back and they didn't make it in. 
Um, but there weren't necessarily, I'm just thinking back to the, going back to, yeah. Um, yeah, there was no nine or 10. Um, I, I think they, um, that's a good question. I, part of me is a little hazy about whether I had a three and a four or not. Um, but yes, I don't have a three and a four. I did, I might have, yeah. But I, have, I don't. I have to confess, I have, I've read the book several times and I didn't notice that until now. It never, I know, I didn't think about it. Um, I guess, I guess also, um, yeah, yeah, some of the poems got retitled to have names. So I have to think about whether some of the titled poems were actually three and four sequences. So, yeah. yes, yes. And we liked uh, them better with titles. Another question, does the term sequence also relate to your learning? Yes, yes, I think, uh, which my, my dad, if he's watching, which I don't need him to his chime question. in or anything. It's his question. <laughs> oh, <God>. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, my dad probably knows the answer to this because he tested me when I was a child. Um, <laughs> but I do think that um, I often have to find a sequence as my start to an activity. Uh, if I don't, I feel a little lost. So what do you mean by sequence? You, ne you need a, a, a sort of pattern of, of what's coming next? Yes, I think so. I mean, lots of my poems don't necessarily have explicit patterns, but um, yeah, I, I like to sort of figure out, I mean, actually with any activity, I like to figure out what I'm, what I'm doing, what are the parts. Okay. Um, um, how much did you edit these poems? What was what you wrote originally what you published or did you do a lot of editing? I mean, I did a lot of editing, but this, the book did go through three cycle, three drafts with the, um, with Joshua. We, you know, we had the first draft, which I gave him, um, which then we talked about what needed to happen with the book. I added more poems. Um, and then we had the draft that I, that, I submitted to him when he um, chose the book. So we had some time before he actually made the decision to commit to the book. Um, and that's when we did the ordering and we thought about what was staying and what was going. Um, you, you, thank, you thank a lot of people at the, at the end of the book. Did you share a lot of the poems in drafts with other writers? And again, I, I'm asking that because of the intensity of these poems, right? And, and did other writers sometimes have difficulty in knowing, well, is my job to uh, console Prigita or is my job to uh, criticize, you know, to critique her poem, to, to, to help, help the poem? How did that go or did, or did that not happen? That's it. I mean, I shared a lot of poems um, but people were more like just, I think they were just helping me through what was sentimental and what was, you know, what I could keep in and what might be too easy for me, like that I didn't want. Um, a lot of people, um, like I, I gave them, like for example, um, uh, uh, Lara, Lara Mimosa Montes um, has, uh, is the editor, wait, I just wanna, um, um, yeah, I have her book right here, Thresholds. Um, Lara Mimosa Montes is the editor of uh, Triple Canopy, and she and I worked on converting the poems to a, an entirely different project called a Disaster of Insufficiency. And so uh, she actually taught me to see what was in there. And so there were kind of different, different kind of projects with people. My friend Ken White, who's a poet, helped me with a draft we put that draft together and then Joshua wasn't keen on on where we went with that draft so I then that was one version that was a little too animated and maybe too pat um but so um so my friends got involved and um but there were also just um, just really great listeners and and Mike too my partner he was a great um reader and um he really uh sat with me and we we went through lines and talked about them and um, thought about edits and he's been great. Great. Um, was the abstract style of writing difficult or did it come naturally? Well, P Peter could answer that too. <laughs> I, 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 there's a lot of abstraction in my, 
in my work. I, I had a joke once with Dale where he would say, when I was talking and if I was getting ahead of myself, he'd say, could we just find the verb? <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, have you, this is another question, have you always been drawn to writing prose poems or did you fall upon prose in the process of writing and working through your own grief se sequence? I think you've answered that, that this, this, that came along with this, um, uh, it, the, the, the grief was the triggering towards the prose, right? Yeah. Obviously the death of a husband due to a brutal disease and the grief that follows is, is a very upsetting topic. Yet in grief sequence, you somehow maintained a strong voice you clearly wrote grief sequence to show your voice and your experience with death and grief rather than to have the readers pity you. How did you manage to not come across as, as strong and not as weak or pitiful? How did you manage to come across as strong and not as weak or pitiful? I think. You know, that's the risk you right? You know, I, I don't, I think, I don't, it's really for the reader. They can pity me with these poems if they want to. Um, but I also think, um, I, I don't, I generally don't, I haven't come across poets I've pitied. I think that it's, I'm really interested in what we get to, what we bring to the page. And it's an honesty and it's a candor and a bravery that I hope people can trust a reader to, to, to be generous with. Yeah, Richard Wilbur says it's pretty hard to lie in poetry. And I, I, I think that's, you know, it's pretty hard to fake any any of these these, these emotions or concerns um, because they just don't make good poems uh, then. Yeah, yeah. Um, different question. Uh, my favorite part is Glacier National Park and, and the elegy. I found it very interesting that you changed up the format of this poem, having lines spaced in different ways. Why did you do this? Is there a specific order to the different to the different formatting versus the other poems? Yeah, I was I was um, examining the lyric form. I was examining um, more the of the kind of um, uh, the ideas of the sublime in the natural world, and so I wanted it to have more of a landscape um, world to it, and to have a kind of a field of reading and and with and 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 to um have an encounter with the natural world so it wasn't compressed the way a prose poem is good uh similarly did the lyrical nature of the poems come out of the content your writing style or something else i think the content and the writing style and the something else is learning about grief and and death but um this still feels like part of my voice, um, who I, how I process. Great. Um, I noticed the term non-believer a few times. Were you always a non-believer or was this due to your loss? It's a good question, actually. Yeah, I do think, um, you know, what's fascinating is right, you know, maybe whenever I, I guess when I was teaching that Polanski and Cassavetes class, we talked a lot about Polanski's atheism after World War II. Hmm. Um, and I guess for me, it's a very different situation, sorry, but I was just reminded of that. Um, I found that um, when I was, I, I found that it was very hard beyond my cultural experience of Hinduism, which I have an affection for, um, to um, after watching Dale die and not feeling any, uh, any, or understanding of, or symbolic understanding of his death um, in witnessing it. I just didn't find that I had a way, uh, an access to an idea of God after that. I, I just didn't, um, and I didn't have signs. Um, I had some dreams, but I didn't, I, I found that a lot of the of support groups widows and widowers were reliant upon um, more uh, ideas of faith and devotion. I just, they were not helping me through the grieving process. So I, so I wanted to be explicit about that. Um, you're, you're bringing up Polanski and Cassavetes. <clears throat> uh, those are films, right? I mean, they're filmmakers. Um, 
do you think, I'm not even sure where I'm going with this, but do you think that, uh, I guess it, would, it seems to me it would be harder to grieve through a film than, than in a poem. Does, does poetry have a particular lane of the highway that, that deals well with grief? Or is that, is that too precious? Is that unfair to poetry? Um, I do think it does have a lane. It seems to have a lane. Um, I, I, you know, I started to, I'm just trying to think about what films, you know, um, function in the same way. And, um, None spring to mind, it jumped to yeah. my mind. Yeah. Tarkovsky, um, I, I'm just blanking on the film that really, really struck me. Um, but, but yeah, I guess, I mean, it just felt true to um, examine this through poetry. Um, yeah, I think about Cassavetes and I mean, I, um, yeah, that's all about life. <laughs> Cassavetes, even if there's a slow death in there. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> um, a general question, in what way has writing about grief changed you? I, I feel very open to the world in a way. I'm so grateful. Um, so uh, working through this grief, and I've, I've made a lot of beautiful new friends um, through grief and through poetry. I, I just feel open. It opened me up. Um, Great. Uh, thank you, Brigitte, for sharing your grief and your voice. I am curious what you found helpful as a young person grieving that was not not faith-based. People our age often recoil from reaching out to people grieving or they offer Judeo-Christian based platitudes that they don't realize may not speak to many of us. So I guess the question is, what did you find that was helpful that was not faith-based? Uh, I guess reading, reading poems that were not necessarily um, examining a devout position um, I mean, Alice Notley is a great example. Um, and um, I just, I just started, you know, I guess I, that the reason, the way I met Mike was I, I asked everybody who experienced loss to talk to me. <laughs> I, you know, I just became open to people. I believed um, that was something I, that I felt very open emotionally to people. Um, and as much as Dale was a complicated person, I, I believed in our love. He didn't leave me, he died. So I was open to trying to figure out what this meant. What does it mean? Um, so I guess without, without God, I just, um, I believed in people. Good. I actually was teaching uh, Pose the Raven today in class, in cl class called Ghost Stories, and, and the critical moment is when the narrator asks what the raven means, right? <clears throat> that, and and to the moment you do that, that's, that's when you open yourself. In fact, the, the first word when the raven enters the poem is open, I open the window. Um, so, so that sense of opening is the first step in the, in the process, and, and we see it in a poem like, like, like the raven, I think. Uh, did your view on poetry and poets change as a result of, of writing grief sequence? Yeah, yeah, I think, I mean, I, I think about, you know, just in the classroom, we, we have some ways of teaching um, that can somehow sometimes feel formulaic or prescriptive. And I guess when I came back to the classroom, I was really invested in um, just getting to know where my students were coming from a little bit more when they were writing their poem. How could I, you know, help them uh, really find their forms and their voice? So things felt more, I had more urgency and um, a different kind of a commitment um, to connect. Great, good. Uh, would you say the majority of the book was intended to be cathartic? Or what are other reasons you wanted to share and display your grief? Yeah, certainly it is cathartic, but I guess it's it's really just to document the the experience I had as I was having it. I wanted to. I knew that you know, when I'm five years out now, and I feel like a different person. But I know that this book helps me um, 
uh, uh, kind of um, keep that person I was close, which mm. was a lot to me. And to remind people that what you go through, through are real experiences in their moments, but their moments slowly change. Good, great. Yeah. Uh, may, may, be, may, the reason, may, may the reason for not having sequences three and four be dyscalculia? Dyscalculia? <laughs> Again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's my no surprise. <laughs> um, I'll go on. Um, can you speak to, to processing grief in the context of the current pandemic and protests? We talked a little bit about this in class today, didn't we? Yeah. I, I mean, I can, I can say that we're, um, you know, I really hope that, um, I really I, November can't come fast yeah. enough. Um, what I did say in Peter's class is that um, what I do hope is we're trying to take care of each other ver remotely and through reading and um, through through the kinds of care that we can at a distance. Um, but it is a it is a impossible time, mm. and I, and I grieve for the people who have lost their loved ones and for people. Um, who are who are who are um, ill alone, yeah. and, and for the violence of our current administration. Yeah, I remember saying that the election four years ago was elec an election about language. What, how, how are words like liberal or immigrant or, you know, the way that language was being used uh, to pigeonhole? And uh, I think this is an election about empathy. Yes. Imaginative yeah. empathy and, and to what degree do we hold it or, or not and manifest it as a democracy even. Uh, anyhow, well, November will be here in eight weeks. So uh, in your poems, you remark a lot on little details and descriptions. Why do you focus so much on those in your poems? Oh, again, as a document, you want to try to hold um, as much of a memory as you can, I think, to make it alive to you every time you return to it. So, um, so for me, um, whether it's description or you know, I'm I'm trying to recall as much as possible, um, so that I can hold that memory close or th that idea. Um, so yeah, it reminds me of the line I quoted in, in, in introducing to you, right? An, an attachment to everything we put into poetry. That's what poetry is, right? Uh, somehow being attached to every single thing that we put, put in there. Yeah. Uh, this is our last question. Um, uh, in the piece, Morning, you said that the trees were acting to be trees. I interpreted this as memories intertwined with those objects. Just curious, what was the original intent of using the term acting, and what what do memories mean to you? Uh, I'm I'm thinking about acting as you say, but I'm also referencing John Ashbery, Some Trees. Okay. And so I'm calling that poem in to also be this kind of vibrant um, moment of re also recognizing that the poems are speaking to me again. That that reading poems. And other poets that I, who I love are as an act of engagement and suddenly starting to now love the poems I used to love. Great, that's nice to hear. I'm glad for that. Um, just to warn everybody, you know, webinars sort of have a cold, hard ending. They just end at a certain point. Uh, but I want to thank Pragita for, for being here, for giving us such a wonderful reading, for doing such a wonderful conversation uh, with my students and, and this conversation with our uh, attendees uh, tonight. Um, anything you'd like to end saying, Brigitte, yourself? Yes, I welcome Simon's Rockers um, to get in touch with me to ask any qu questions about poetry or grad school or, or anything about Simon's Rock and creative writing, because I have such a wonderful time there and I wouldn't be who I am today without, without Peter and without Simon's Rock. And I'm always happy to be in touch with the writers at Simon's Rock. Well, Pagita knows how proud I am of how she's carried herself 
uh, through the war zones of the poetry world and uh, which they are war zones, um, but she's always carried herself with great dignity and poise and never more so than in grief sequence, uh, which I think is a truly marvelous book. Um, and she knows I don't say that easily. When I say it, I really mean it. It's a terrific book. Uh, thank you, Pagita, for being here. Thank you to our audience for being here. Uh, come back and see us uh, during our other readings, uh, Mona Simpson, uh, Valeria Luiselli, and Peter Gizzi uh, throughout the fall. You can find them on the college's events calendar online. Thank you again, Pagita. Thank you so much for having me. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs>